Um, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome back um, for those of you who came to Legal Tech Venture Day. Welcome um, to those who are here for the um, UNSW Faculty of Law and Justice Legal Hour. Um, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Lyria Bennett-Moses. I am the director of the UNSW Allens Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation and a professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice. Um, I acknowledged country earlier for those who were at the earlier event, but for those who've just arrived, I would like to acknowledge that we have this wonderful event here um, on Gadigal land, and I would like to pay my respects um, to their elders um, past and present, um, and acknowledge that we need to go beyond words that get said in events um, to putting the right words um, where they matter in the context of the ongoing conversations about the voice. Um, thank you, um, Alans, um, again, also for hosting um, the event today. Thank you um, to um, Professor Andrew Lynch, who is here in the audience, the Dean of the Faculty of Law and Justice for participating in the event today, and to the um, alumni team from the faculty who helped put all of this together. So, what we have now um, is a very exciting panel. Um, I'd like to quickly introduce um, our panellists. Um, so Evan Wong, who's an alum of the um, U of UNSW in both law and commerce, but um, since then um, is CEO and co-founder of Checkbox.ai. Um, Professor Michael Legg, my colleague in the UNSW Faculty of Law and Justice, and Lisa Cazares, who is the Chief Innovation and Legal Solutions Officer here at Allens. Um, so so I'm not going to be boring um, for very long, other than what you've already heard. We're going to go um, straight into the questions. Um, we've taken some of these um, from the ones that you um, all put um, when you registered for the event, so you might recognise um, some of them. Um, so to start out, when thinking about automation and AI in legal practice, um, there is some sort of low-hanging fruit um, and there are other aspects that machines um, will never replace. Where do you think automation is imminent and where will humans remain at the centre of things um, for the foreseeable future? And Lisa, if I can start with you. Sure, happy to kick off. Um, well, I think it's fair to say we're all hearing a lot about AI at the moment and in particular um, generative AI, a bit of a hot topic. Um, but one of the things that you might not all be aware is that we've actually been using AI and automation in earnest for a good almost decade now, certainly within Allens, that's the case. Um, so it's now very much for us business as usual in a number of our practices. Um, in terms of that low hanging fruit, I might give you sort of three, two or three examples to give you a sense of what that looks like in practice. Um, the first area is in disputes and investigations. So as you would all know, often we have to um, manage quite large volumes of data um, and, and really help our lawyers get their heads around documents and data so they can understand the facts of the case, but also to satisfy and fulfil our discovery obligations or, or our obligations to, to a regulator. Um, so we've been using machine learning for quite some time. Essentially, um, our lawyers work in hand in hand with technologists to train an AI model to recognise what is a relevant document and what isn't. So as lawyers are making decisions, relevant yes, relevant no, relevant yes, those decisions get fed into an AI model which is able to make pretty accurate predictions over a much, much larger document set, um, which means, doesn't do away with our lawyers, of course, but it enables them to really focus on those documents most likely to be relevant, um, rather than sitting there rifling through hundreds of thousands of documents. Um, so again, that's one area, pretty much 100% of our disputes and investigations now, that's business as usual, and, and really our clients get the cost benefit of that. Um, the second bucket is is in the contract review and due diligence space. Um, and I was speaking to a few friends how, here that are focusing on diligence themselves. Um, really, what we want our lawyers to be doing is focusing on the analysis and legal impact of, of um, the DD exercise. So what we do use is technology that's able to automatically identify key provisions, extract them and present them for lawyers to review. So rather than lawyers having to flick through pages of documents to identify a change of control clause, for example, it's automatically identified, extracted and presented to them. So again, not doing away with them, but really enabling them to, to exercise their legal judgment and intellect um, and really focus on the work we want them to be doing. 
Um, third low hanging fruit, uh, uh, and then I might pass it on to Evan because I know that you're doing a lot in this space, is around um, stream streamlining document creation. So again, rather than having to reinvent the wheel um, and really you know, rifle through and find when was the last time I did a shared purchase agreement or, um, you know, try and find a precedent. We're using doc automation to pre-build best practice templates, essentially, to help our lawyers get to that first draft stage um, a lot more efficiently. Um, also helps to de-risk some of that document creation work because our lawyers are always using the most up-to-date templates. Um, so in terms of your broader question, uh, they're just a, a few examples of that low hanging fruit, but, but really the goal there for us is to streamline and take out a lot of that manual, repetitive, lower level work so that our lawyers can really focus on the, the work that requires their legal judgment, their strategic thinking, their innovative thinking, and really that work that they ultimately want to be doing. So thank you. Michael. Uh, so I, I guess, so my response to I guess your question is to sort of think about um, what does the AI enhanced lawyer of the future, what, what's the, the human aspects that they have that allows them to continue to add value um, and you know, really for the existence of, of lawyers to continue? Uh, and there's, I think, three um, points to consider there. Um, the first is expertise, um, and that's expertise that you know, they will be using AI but there's a, there's a piece that needs to be asked about what does the, the lawyer provide? Um, and I think a way of thinking about that is they provide the judgment, the practical wisdom, the drawing on experience um, to try and address the client's problem in context. So it's, it's, it's well and good to, to um, if you like, be more efficient and get the benefits of the AI, but then it's trying to assist the uh, client in knowing what to do. So uh, is there a way in which you can help the client meet their needs and concerns? Um, the second one is uh, often referred to as like the, the human skills or qualities. Um, and th this is sort of interesting because normally we talk about things like empathy and trust. Um, I noticed recently that a number of commentators have been saying, oh, you know, I use the, the new generative AI and it's more empathetic than the lawyers that I deal with. Um, <laughs> you're sort of like, well, well, that's, that's a little bit of a problem. Um, but I think that the part that they miss is that, yes, you can have AI that might be able to give you answers, um, which, which is framed using words that appear to be empathetic. But there's, there's a big difference between uh, signifying and experiencing empathy. And I think as humans, um, whilst we might like the fact that um, the particular AI is polite and you know, talks to us nicely, um, we know that it's not a person. And so really when you're dealing with some really important issues, um, whether that be a corporate acquisition or a, a family law dispute, um, it's the human that's your lawyer uh, that, that becomes important. It's the fact that they are real um, that's important to, to, to the client. And then um, I guess the, th the third thing is uh, ethics. And I've, on many occasions I have had uh, lawyers sort of say that this is in fact the thing that gets in the way and holds them back because AI doesn't have to comply with ethical responsibilities like lawyers do. But I actually think it's a competitive advantage for lawyers, the fact that they have ethical responsibilities. Things like their um, duty to act in the best interest of the client. Uh, AI does not have that duty. Um, indeed, uh, commerce, commercial entities don't have that duty, okay? Um, and then another one would be something like confidentiality or in particular, legal professional privilege. Mm. They are obligations which lawyers have and which set them apart from really um, anyone else, including AI. Um, and I suppose the, the, the one last thing to mention in terms of ethics is it's the fact that um, as lawyers, um, you've got a duty to the administration of justice. And so what the lawyer does is not just about serving a client. The lawyer is part of our sort of social structure, our community. They're there to support the rule of law. Um, and often we sort of forget about that because people focus on the sort of, you know, um, the profitability or, you know, how much is things that are costing. 
but uh, lawyers actually have a much larger role to play. Um, and, and that's what I think will separate them from AI. Thanks, Larry. Evan. Uh, there's so much I want to unpack there. So um, I, let me start with sort of some of what Lisa was mentioning. So when, when we go back to sort of low hanging fruit um, and, and distinguishing sort of automation from AI, because they are related but different concepts, right? I think automation plays a role in, as Lisa was alluding to, a lot of the low value, low risk, high volume type work. We can shift our attention to the kind of higher, um, more strategic work, the more in, impactful work. Um, but where AI sort of takes that further is start to look into sort of drawing inferences. So if we use a document automation sort of document generation use case, you don't need AI to do that, right? So basic document automation can just use rules, computer logic to decide to include a clause or not, to insert a party's name dynamically. Where it kind of stretches into the AI realm where we are today in generative AI is maybe looking across all of the uh, executed documents in an organization, in a law firm, and finding the actual general position uh, that finds the uniform standardized viewpoint of the firm and then creates that sort of draft for you. Right? That's where the AI can actually read through a whole bunch of data and be able to take that document automation piece even further. Right? And I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit still in that type of work. It's not going to be replacing um, a lot of the more complex advice into uh, Professor Legg's uh, point here. It's, 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 a lot of it is also requiring context, right? Because um, uh, was, uh, I was, I was uh, at a conference recently and there was um, a person um, who said, uh, ChatGPT is kind of like autocomplete on steroids. But it doesn't have context of the world. It doesn't have context of truth. It doesn't understand those worldly, real-life concepts. And so what that means is it, it, it doesn't have the ability to um, actually get to the correct human answer. And look, I don't, I'm, a, I'm an optimist when it comes to technology. I'm sure it will improve dramatically on that front. But to give you an example, you know, to, to overcome that challenge, the, the data set that these kind of AI models and open AI is trained on is, is sort of general. When we apply it to the law, it requires a very specific legal corpus to train upon. And when you use it in a corporate context as well, it needs to take into the consideration of the, the business context of that specific organization, let alone the industry. And yes, you can train on that data, but actually it's really expensive, right? It's a process called fine tuning and it costs a lot of money to actually go to OpenAI, submit your data so that they can actually carve out a separate sort of improved model of that generic one that's available to all of us as consumers when you go on their website, right? And so there's, it's interesting because I think there's a technical barrier, but there's also not, uh, not just a technical barrier, but also a commercial barrier mm -hmm. to it. And so I think, you know, as we, as we look into what's the role of lawyers, um, there, there is an economic sort of barrier right now to replace lawyers because we have the context. Uh, we have the human element. We have the context of our clients. We have the context of our firm and our businesses that we, that we serve. Thank you. Michael, I'm going to come back to you, because particularly because you talked about the sort of ethics piece. So what are the ramifications of AI or, or automation, we use both words, providing legal services without lawyers? Um, and of course, without then, you know, without those associated fees. OK. Um, so the, the thing that I think this is a... Um, the reason I like this question is because <laughs> I think what it does is uh, often when we talk about AI, we're focused on what can it do? You know, it's, it's all about, you know, can it do this? Can it, can it not do this? Mm. Um, what I think this starts to point to is the regulatory or political aspects of AI um, in relation to the legal profession. And so on one view, um, a lot of people have been promoting AI and automation because of the access to justice benefits you might be able to use AI um, to really help out people who can't afford a lawyer. And we've seen some great um, examples of that occurring. Um, but I guess the, uh, the other concern is, at what point um, does AI start to practice law? Um, or uh, to use the words uh, in the regulations that govern us, um, when does it involve engaging in legal practice by unqualified entities. <laughs> um, and that is going to be a big question because as AI gets better and better, um, it's not just going to be sort of providing legal information. It may get very close to actually providing legal advice or practicing law. And so the, the, the question that then arises is, why do we have a legal profession 
Um, why do we limit the practice of law to people who, have, uh, who are qualified and admitted to practice law? Um, and you know, we know that those reasons are about you know, protecting the client consumer. Um, uh, it, it's about, I guess, you know, providing um, them with uh, people that are skilled, but also, um, dare I say it, things like indemnity insurance. Um, so that if something goes wrong, um, there, there's, you know, there's, there's backing for the people that might have um, made a mistake. It, it's about trying to have the quality of legal services there. Um, so you end up with this sort of debate about is this, is this about improving access for consumers or, or is this really about protecting the legal monopoly? Um, and that then I think creates a, a, a bit of a, a complexity which is um, if we accept that there might be a downside to AI providing legal services, um, at what point does someone step up and actually challenge that? So actually bring a case and say, this is the provision of legal services and they can't do this. Um, and that, I think, is when the politics starts to come alive because uh, who, and this might be a regulator, um, who is it that wants to sort of say, oh no, we can't have AI being provided when it's promoted as being about access to justice. So there's, a, there's quite a difficult question there as to how that plays out. And I think that the last point here is just, to, I guess, to be, I guess, a little sceptical and say, um, is this about, you know, access to justice um, and sort of breaking down the legal monopoly? Or is this about taking a monopoly that currently exists for lawyers and giving it to someone else? tech providers. And so the access to justice that we're so hopeful for may not actually eventuate. Um, it may just be that you're paying someone else for your legal services. So are legal jobs safe for now? <laughs> yeah. um, I think they're safe for now. <laughs> um, but, but there is no doubt that uh, AI is going to continue to improve. Hmm. And, and that's when you get to... So as AI gets better and better, that's when you get to that point of... Um, when do we sort of say, actually, it's going too far and practising law? And if somebody wants to sort of bring that case, mm. the next step, of course, is when does government say, oh, we want to deregulate and what lawyers are allowed to do actually shrinks? And the United Kingdom is a good example of that. They have reduced the areas that, are, that only lawyers can do down to six areas. Um, and so you, that then starts to sort of really reshape the way the legal profession looks and who its competitors are. Okay, so and um, you know one of the you know particularly hot topics in technology um, at the moment is um, ChatGPT. So and, and there's a lot of sort of I, you know a lot of people have played around with it. You know students might have tried to get it to write their essays every now and then. <laughs> um, all of these things are probably happening. But but if we're looking at sort of this realistically in legal practice, what are some of the sort of use cases or, or sort of um, potential ways in which this kind of generative AI technology might be used in the legal profession? Um, Evan, I might start with you on that one. Sure, sounds good. Um, so I see it sort of being used clearly in three areas, right, in legal. This is generative AI or AI in, in concept. Um, the first is around contracting. We talked a little bit about contracting, but contracting has different stages to its life cycle. Um, so let's talk about three of the key components of that. Uh, the first is generation. We've already talked about that, so I won't go through that again. The second is around contract review. So not the drafting aspect, but actually the review of the contract. Um, currently, without AI, you know, we have humans, lawyers, reading through, identifying different risks, getting through you know, different um, uh, uh, third-party paper that's not familiar to us. Um, using AI, um, we're able to you know, scan through those documents highlight and identify certain risk areas automatically and flag them up. In fact, you can even use generative AI right now to say, can you read this document for me and tell me what happens if, you know, um, if I were to breach this contract through a uh, data breach disclosure. It would be able to actually find that clause automatically, understand semantically what that is, and then surface for you that obligation. It might say something like, well, you have 48 hours to report, and if if you're not able to make that time frame, then you might be sued for damages, but then there's a liability cap of $2 million, right? It's able to do that right now. That's what it allows us to do, and you don't have to actually go through the document. Um, the third area is post, uh, post signature and, and contract obligation. So once the contract has been executed, um, one of the biggest pain points is 
well, there's a bunch of promises and performances that need to happen off that contract. It's a document that promises some sort of you know, transaction, some sort of you know, um, event or activity. How do we ensure those, those obligations are met? So again, AI is able to uh, pull out those obligations, things like renewal clauses, um, specific quality of, of, of SLAs, and be able to actually launch workflows and reminders um, and, and create sort of analytics around that. So there's a lot of work that can be done with AI around the contracting piece. The second bucket is really around knowledge management and sort of general advice. So I'm not talking about very specific advice. I don't think it'll get into the world of maybe uh, being used uh, to, to, to kind of replace lawyers in like an M&A transaction. But if you're talking about, say, very black and white policy and getting advice around that, then yes, you can actually feed the corpus of uh, you know, policies and regulation to an AI engine. And it's able to, you can then, using natural language, ask it questions. Perhaps this is the scenario. Is it an employee or contractor scenario? Simple example there. And it will be able to give you some basic advice around that. Or perhaps this is a scenario. Is it an unfair dismissal? It can give you advice around that. And the third area um, is really around operations, which is probably talked a little bit less than, than the other two. But around uh, in business, a lot of legal is just really a function like HR and procurement and risk and compliance. It's part of the giant corporate beast. There's a lot of op operations that happen alongside the delivery of legal services. And AI can also, in, in, in the generative sense, can, can play a key role there. For example, you have a, um, a product manager coming over to the legal department, and let's say it's a legal department of 200 people. They all have different capacities and specializations, and there's nuance to all the activities that they can provide, from NDAs to advice around IP. We can use AI so that the product manager comes to legal and says, well, in free text, this is the scenario. Can you help me? And the AI can take you automatically to the appropriate lawyer or perhaps even give you the answer straight away. And that's really the application of AI in a, in a legal operations context. So that's really how I see the three areas, contracting, knowledge management, and operations. Lisa, any of those gelling with what's happening at Allen's or you're, what you're thinking yeah, about? Look, um, all of them are gelling with what we're thinking about. <laughs> and um, look, what I would say is it's still relatively early days. Um, so at Allen's, we've set up a cross-functional working group. So really people from a variety of different disciplines um, that are looking at questions from an ethics perspective, confidentiality perspective, potential copyright perspective, but also potential use cases to Evan's point. And all of those are in the mix of things that we're looking at. Um, but we are seeing, and, and I'm sure for all of you that have experimented with it yourself, there are some pretty clear limitations right now um, around its use. So. Um, um, we are talking to our lawyers about really encouraging them to experiment and have a play, but really um, uh, imploring them to exercise caution around its use on client work. Um, in particular, we're asking them to really think about it through the lens of it's possible that your inputs could be seen by a third party outside of Allen's and therefore be conscious of what you're inputting into the, the, the mm. system because right now that's that's a possibility. So um, it's very much a, right now one of experimentation in, in people's personal um, lives as opposed to being used in earnest in client work. Um, but to your point, Evan, something you touched on, um, one of the, the things that we're thinking a lot about is when you think about a law firm, firm like Allen's um, and the corpus of documents that we sit on, we've obviously advised a lot of clients in a lot of sectors across a variety of transactions. That data set is incredibly rich and valuable. So that ability to use it to, to create first drafts of contracts over, and trained on a very high quality data set, you know, there's certainly potential there, but very early days, um, a lot of legal considerations and ethical considerations to work through. Um, so yeah, come and talk to me in six months and um, <laughs> I'll we'll have a live use yeah, case. Yeah, exactly. And, and it sounds like a sort of, um, in terms of the, the the sort of junior solicitors and so forth, the sort of education absolutely. piece education as well. Absolutely, education and awareness, because we think it will absolutely play a role and, and be a tool in the toolkit. Um, as, it, as we talked about before, there's already a lot of tools in that toolkit already. Already. So I don't think it's going to necessarily flush all of those away, but it will absolutely be a toolkit. Um, and as long as we get to the point where our lawyers are um, aware of its capabilities, importantly its limitations, and are really scrutinising the output and exercising their judgement um, around the output that, that it's producing as well, that's um, 
that's critical because as, as we've all seen, it, it can sound very convincing and it absolutely hallucinates and um, hence at the moment certainly can't be, can't be relied upon in anything in our sort of context for clients. And Evan, have you, you gave the, the three examples before, do you see different risks associated with those? Absolutely. So I've, I think I've, I've come across very bullish on... <laughs> let, me tell you, let, me, <laughs> let me tell you the other side, right? So, so hallucinations is, is a very real thing. I'll give you an example, right? So I was trying to find an example in the way here. So I went to ChatGPT and I typed in, tell me about the case where... Uh, uh, tell me about the case which is Wong versus Qantas. And it comes back and it says, well, let me tell you about this case where uh, Marcus Wong um, uh, sued Qantas for loyalty points and, and it went through this whole case. It was very, very convincing. And I said, no, I'm looking for the one where it's Evan Wong versus Qantas. And it said, uh, it said apologies, my mistake. You are correct. <laughs> and then it gave me the case of me suing Qantas, which obviously never happened, by the way. So... But, but the way that it kind of came back with that fake mm. um, scenario, fake case law, is very, very dangerous. Because if I was, not, you know, if I didn't know better, if I were to rely on it, mm. it's, it's complete fluff. It's made up. And uh, to, to Professor Legg's point, it's very, like, there's a difference between empathy, like true empathy and displayed empathy, right? Because it's really good at saying, oh, my apologies, you are correct, let me give you the actual truth, which is not the truth, right? Um, <laughs> and that's dangerous, like, because it sounds, like, chat GPT sounds intelligent. It's concise, it's professional, mm. it's likable because it apologizes. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's got a bit of humor built in, like, it's, it's, uh, it's really dangerous because then you, you tend to place a lot of trust in, in basically what is equivalent now of fake news, but now it's fake I don't know what to describe, but fake facts, and um, uh, that's a really big risk, right? And I think there's another risk, which is um, what Lisa touched on, which is privacy. Um, I don't know if, 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 if people here have heard recently about the Samsung incident. They basically uh, leaked a bunch of internal Sam Samsung data because they uh, used ChatGPT um, with, with, with sort of you know, sensitive information. And uh, they've issued a ban now that no uh, employees can use AI. And a bunch of other sort of um, mm. companies <laughs> followed suit, like Citi, Citigroup, uh, JP Morgan, et cetera. And um, it, it's, it's a really real concern. And it's interesting to me because putting a ban on using AI, I think, is a Band-Aid solution whilst the policy and training keeps up. I don't think it's wise to put a... It's, it's, it's going to be here. It's going to be used whether you like it or not. I think... Um, we need the right guardrails and the right training um, in order to enable it, right? So it's no different from taking your briefcase full of client information and just opening it up in the middle of, you know, town hall and just letting people pick it up and read it. Obviously, no one would sensibly do that in the same way that you shouldn't really be putting client information into a publicly shared, you know, pool of data that, that, the, that the AI model uses. Um, so I don't think putting a ban on that in the same way that you, you, you don't put a ban on people taking a briefcase across town hall um, would be a viable option. I think it's actually training and guardrails that need to catch up with you know, the advent of technology now. Now, sp speaking of bans, I mean, you know, the education sector has been one, um, particularly at the secondary level, where there's been these calls for bans and in some state school systems, bans and so forth. Um, now, that's not because of the privacy reason. It's not that all of these kids have, you know, secret information <laughs> that um, they might share. Um, but what about universities, Michael? What, 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 what are they telling law students? Well, I think, um, I mean, in some ways, I, I think we've, we've got the answer from what we've just heard, which is this is going to be part of uh, your legal practice in the future. Therefore, um, something like a, a chat GPT really needs to become part of the legal research and writing that is taught at university. Um, now, having said that, um, and I'm sure the, uh, my colleagues that teach legal research and writing are cursing me at this point, because <laughs> um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a learning curve there for the people who are teaching as well as for the, the students. Um, so I think you, you have to embrace it um, because just like um, the tools that we use to research case law and legislation, um, students need to be able to do that. Yes. So we have to start that process. Uh, but at the same time, I guess, we also need to factor in that uh, there are some other things that we need to teach, which may be um, situations where you don't want somebody to use uh, AI. 
And so if you're trying to teach students substantive legal knowledge, um, it may be that you, because you want them to know that, not know where to find it, you want them to actually know it, um, then you might say, well, we still need exams and we need to set that up so that you can't access AI. Um, and so it's about saying, well, what skill are we trying to teach? And, and I guess the other thing to note is we've also got to be careful that whilst we embrace technology, uh, we need to make sure that we don't forget about making sure that they're across the black letter law, mm. making sure that they um, are actually working on those human skills. Mm. Uh, and I have to say that's one of the things that I, I, I would say I've noticed in, say, the last five years is students used to complain about doing group work and collaboration and needing to show leadership. It was all, you know, can't I just do my own stuff? Whilst today, they recognise that it's a skill set they need to be able to practise. It's a skill set they need to be, you know, a viable human being um, in society, and they embrace it. Um, and so I, I, I think we just need to get that, that balance right. OK, so hopefully universities are successful um, and these people are going to become lawyers. Like, what does the future lawyer look like? Um, and will that work? Evan, do you want to go first and then maybe Lisa? Sure. Um, future lawyer. Look, the future, like, uh, I, I'm predicting here, I don't think anyone truly knows, but, but I think we, um, it's, it's not new, I think it's just been, the conversation has been accelerated that the lawyer of the future, or even now, has to be cross-disciplinary. We have to be tech literate. Um, we have to know how to use technology as a tool. Um, if ChatGPT and, and AI does not replace lawyers, and I don't think it will, but if it doesn't, it will at least be a tool. In the same way that Professor Lake just referred to sort of, um, uh, you know, research tools like your Westlaw and, and LexisNexis, um, lawyers will need to know how to use tools like ChatGPT because it's going to be the new search, right? In the way that we use Google, the way we use legal research. I mean, when I was at UNSW, we did a whole course, I think two courses on how to use and search in these sort of legal, um, uh, you know, legal research tools. Same thing, we need to have that skill set, right? Um, there's a role now, uh, uh, in, in, in sort of the, the world that has come up recently called a prompt engineer. Mm. A prompt engineer is a person who designs and is very good at creating prompts. It's a thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> Can it, by the way, I, I, I'm stealing this because I, I learned this just two days ago. Can anyone guess how much the salary is going in the US for, for a prompt engineer? I heard this just... $350,000 a year for a prompt engineer, yeah. Um, it's a real thing. It's a legitimate thing. And as, as lawyers of the future and even, you know, the now, to be honest, we need to start knowing not necessarily, um, you know, what, what we need to do is how to use it as a tool. What kind of inputs do we put into the AI to get the outputs that are meaningful? How do we um, provide follow-up prompts to actually narrow down the outputs that we have? You know, uh, if you've used ChatGPT, you know that the output that it gives you isn't necessarily the output that you use. You could say, well, make that answer punnier and it will literally make it more punnier. It will add puns, right? And you say, well, make it a bit more serious still with puns and it, it will keep refining the output and, and that sort of skill set is something that I think um, lawyers need to be able to do mm. within the legal context and not just making funny puns about, I don't know, a book about your life. Um, I'm not speaking from experience. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that's, that's really, really important and, and I think one point on the, on, the, on the law school and the education piece is I think law schools also need to start preparing for that skill set. And there's very simple ways of doing that without necessarily breaking, you know, the, the, um, the curriculum and the, and the scaffold and, and the rigidity, uh, not the rigidity, the um, legitimacy of, of the program that's been set. I, I heard an example where um, a, uh, I think it was a, a, a privacy law lecturer um, took outputs from ChatGPT and presented it to their class and said, well, we're, we're learning privacy law. Why don't you tell me what's wrong with these outputs that have come out of ChatGPT? And that trains the students to be able to be familiar with the tool, but also to be critical about the outputs of, of, of these types of um, these tools, because ultimately that's probably what's going to be used in practice, right? to be able to use these tools and be able to critique the outputs mm -hmm. that come out of these tools.
Lisa, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I think all, all spot on agree with much of what you've said there, Evan. Um, certainly from a large law firm perspective, one of the things that we're doing right now actually is, is developing a digital literacy program for the firm, i.e. we're doing a lot of thinking about what are the skills and capabilities our lawyers need in the digital context to be successful lawyers of the future. And it's not about how to code, um, but it's about how to understand the capabilities of AI, automation, um, how to understand general concepts like blockchain and smart contracting, the whole bunch of things that we're looking at there. But that's a program that's going to be rolled out to every lawyer at the firm and there'll be an expectation of lawyers having a, a certain level of capability and it'd be a requirement for promotion, which is pretty pretty revolutionary, right? The lawyers don't know about this yet, but it's, um, <laughs> it's, Some of them it's coming. Um, they do, they do. Um, so that's that's so, so we're, we're considering this is really important, and we're considering this as an important sort of set of capabilities for for our lawyers um, of the future. But interestingly, right now, um, I was chatting before we we walked in. We've got about sixty people in my group that are technologists. Part of them, about half of them, are lawyers. Half of them, about 25% of them are both legal and technical qualified and about 25 have computer science, data science, other sorts of backgrounds. But essentially those technologists are already working hands in hand with our lawyers to develop legal products, to co-create different solutions to client problems. And they're actually translating for each other their separate disciplines and, and solving a client's problem in a different way, which, you know, 10 years ago, frankly, five years ago would have been unheard of. So. Um, and uh, frankly, a lot of the um, startups that you heard from today, they've all been, you know, previous lawyers like Evan and, and myself, previous lawyers. So I think what technology and AI is also presenting is opportunities to diversify our skills and to broaden our skills into all sorts of different areas um, beyond the law, black letter law, which I think actually for law students is, is pretty exciting, a little bit scary, but, but frankly exciting. Um, so I'm going to ask Michael um, a question, um, which is these future lawyers who rely more on automation and AI as part of their, their, their practice of law, um, are they going to get sued and is the law clear enough? Um, but while he's thinking on that, um, I'm just going to point out that I'm about to go to audience questions. So if you can all start to think about a question for the panel, um, I'll be with you right after Michael's told us um, all of the legal risks. Okay. <laughs> Um, now, look, I, I think where, where you, you come down is that um, legal malpractice is, is still an issue. Um, and when you look at you know, traditional um, forms of that, it's often around you know, not showing due care. Um, that, I think, is going to become a, you know, a, a, a bigger issue in the sense that if you have technology that you should have used and you didn't, or you use technology, but you used it incorrectly, you, you, you weren't aware of its limitations, um, then that's going to be a, a potential um, uh, way in which lawyers may get sued. Um, they do need to keep in mind that they can get the help of third parties, so they're, you know, the ability to be able to get expert assistance. Um, but I think the, the, the thing that then becomes interesting is, as a lawyer, you take various steps to try to protect yourself and, and um, make sure you live up to your uh, legal and ethical obligations. But if you have a, a piece of AI that, that malfunctions or doesn't do what you know, it said it was going to do, it then raises for the lawyer whether is there a cross-claim? Are they then suing the um, owner, manufacturer, um, the AI person that, that provided it, because we're, we're assuming AI is not sentient at this stage, so we're, <laughs> we're not suing AI itself. Um, but in that sort of scenario, then you start to look at things like, you know, are we, is it product liability? Is this a defective product? Um, but then you also start to, I think, to, to, get to, to really take an interest in how is AI regulated? And so there's a, a whole you know, area and, and discussion around how do we regulate AI? And I think one of the reasons for lawyers to be uh, uh, interested in that is that is then also going to be a way in which they potentially protect themselves if they're using AI as a, as a way to provide legal services. Um, so there's a standard traditional way in which I think this plays out, uh, but then there's also, I think, a whole range of new sorts of developments that you would need to be aware of. Okay, so I warned you all. Um, who's got the first question? Fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about the, the panel's thoughts about the, the context of, of 
AI and, and kind of the history of challenges to, to legal thinking. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I just come from a tech, more of a technology background. But if you think of things like Airbnb and you know, Uber, they were challenges to, to legal regimes. Um, is this on par with that? Is it bigger? Or is what was most recent, previous, big uh, challenge to the way we think about law that might be on par with what we're seeing today with the new AI? Hmm. He wants to tackle that one. I can start. Um, so one, I would say it is bigger than the disruption from a legal framework um, and policy framework than the examples you gave Uber and uh, Airbnb, which are tremendous, of course, but I think this is actually much more widespread because this is going to apply to millions of use cases and use cases that we haven't even thought about, right? And I think there's so many areas, and I'll give you a, a specific example. Um, we're talking about sort of liability in relying on AI, but actually there's a whole new area of law that opens up as well, or considerations in law because of generative AI. For example, intellectual property is a very bang on topic when it comes to generative AI. You put in the inputs into, into ChatGPT and the outputs come out. Do you own that IP? Is that yours? Or is that uh, you know, the, the, the people who created the model? Um, and when you look into sort of intellectual property law, if you apply sort of traditional concepts um, of control of outcome, choice of outcome, and um, uh, it being a human, I think, is part of the requirements as well. If I uh, think back to my days at UNSW Law School, <laughs> don't quote me on any of those, by the way. Um, uh, you know, AI will play and, and fit some of those. For example, you would say, OK, well, AI is not a human. It's not a human producer of work, and therefore it doesn't fit within that framework. But then also um, you need to understand sort of you know, who, who, who ends up owning the IP and how much of the prompter um, and their sort of intellectual capacity that goes into um, the model is, is then determining the, the ownership of the IP uh, that comes out the other end, right? Um, and different jurisdictions will have different laws around IP. And so there's, I think there's this whole entire universe of, of that will need to be considered um, in, within legal. And, and I'm just using IP as an example there. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot. Well, so it, I mean, it's interesting because I, I, I don't think there has been anything of this magnitude. Uh, if, if you think back about what are the things that have you know, disrupted the legal profession or, or, or challenged it, I would say the, the, the biggest one was probably in around the 1980s when there was uh, a, effectively a competition law review uh, that really looked at the legal profession and said, um, a lot of your practices are outdated, they're expensive, um, some of the areas that uh, you, you, know, you have to use a lawyer for, we don't think you really need. Um, the classic example is conveyancing, you know, you want to sell your house, you used to have to do that through a lawyer, not anymore. Um, but although at the time, um, lawyers were deeply concerned about this, mm. I don't think it's, uh, it has anything on what we're looking at at the moment. But I, I guess the, you know, your, your analogy with, say, an Airbnb or an Uber, I think, is, is interesting because um, it really asks the question, can we see somebody who's going to provide legal services but actually have no lawyers? Mm. Um, which is, you know, that, that's the, the, that sort of uh, business model. Mm. And the thing that stops that at the moment is the regulation that says only lawyers are able to provide legal services. Um, but then uh, taxi drivers would tell you that um, there was a law that said <laughs> only they. <laughs> um, so maybe there'll be a class action in the future where the lawyers are suing AI. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think this is it. I think this is the, the biggest thing we've seen so far. Yeah, and look, I'd agree with that. I um, feel we are on somewhat of a cusp of a transformation here. I don't think it'll be overnight, a la Airbnbs of the world, but I do think we are on the verge of some significant change. Um, how quickly that change happens and what that looks like, time will tell. And, and whether that will result in sort of more self-service legal solutions of the sort that you've described, I think it probably will in certain contexts. Um, but I think this is, is probably the biggest shift that, yeah. that the profession's experienced. We are looking at a technical boundary where lawyers want to cross. Now, if you actually 
look at the techn technological boundaries which have been crossed in transportation, in communication, and in products. What have we seen? We have seen that the completion time and the completion cost has come down drastically. Also, we have seen the percolation of these products in the usage in the society has increased drastically. I think we should look at the technological situation which the boundary we are crossing exactly in the same manner. And just quick and cheap is what will happen. So the time element that you will, from the time you get the case to the time you get the decision and the time of implementation will come down drastically and the cost will come down drastically. So actually it will happen a much larger uh, social segment which at present is not able to get justice, mm -hmm. will have access to justice. So actually, I think instead of lawyers being less in demand, there'll be more and more lawyers in demand. Mm -hmm. No, no, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's definitely a view that um, what you could do is because you can drive down the cost of legal services, people that couldn't afford the legal services in the past then can. Um, but the legal service that they're accessing is going to be more um, automated um, than what they would have uh, accessed in the past. Whether um, that leads to lawyers, um, I guess, continuing to be profitable is another question, because I think it's, a, who is it that's going to provide those mm. uh, legal services? Um, but it, it's, it, it, it's interesting, I guess, to sort of try to work out whether, um, it, it's when you think about something like a court um, and are we going to get the judgment uh, more quickly, there I think it's going to be harder for something like um, artificial intelligence to, to completely take over the process because I think various characteristics of a court and the way in which um, our justice system works is going to mean AI just, it, it can't be used. It's, it's not going to have the, the abilities that we need for that. So I think, yes, in terms of getting, say, advice and maybe helping in some transactions, uh, but in something like litigation, I think it would be harder. Sorry, yes. I'd like to thank the panel for all your stimulating contributions. So I have a question about um, mainstream attitudes towards AI and the law and trust towards the profession. I think if you ask the regular person on the street what they think of the intersection of AI and the law, they wouldn't necessarily think of a set of tools. They would think of something being done to them. Mm -hmm. I think robo debt would come to mind. Mm -hmm. I think surveillance would come to mind. I think you know, society start, it's starting to look like a Black Mirror episode for a lot of people. <laughs> Uh, of course, there are exceptions. I mean, I have a friend who I've been trying to discourage him from this, but he's self-representing himself in a family law matter, and he started to use ChatGPT to help him with a lot of his submissions, right? And that's definitely a tool. It is a tool, not necessarily a good tool. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, how concerned are you about popular attitudes towards AI and the law? Uh, and how important is, do you think, for us as you know, people who are engaging in this conversation largely amongst a couple of professions to try to steer those attitudes towards a you know, better, more realistic direction? Hmm. Can I go for it? Um, <laughs> no, uh, look, I, I think that's something that the, the legal profession needs to be uh, very concerned about. Um, the, the fact is the profession is there to serve society. And I think that gets lost sometimes. Um, people you know, focus on their billable hours and the profits that can be made. The, the, the fact is, um, if, if society doesn't see the benefit of the profession, then that's when we will get the deregulation that says, oh, we don't really need you know, lawyers to do this anymore. We can move more towards using something like AI. Or I think more a, we will have people who are not qualified as lawyers um, uh, providing the AI. Um, and so the, the legal profession undoubtedly needs to show its value. I think that, that's absolutely uh, central. Um, and part of that, I think, is we need to be better um, at dealing with the situations where people can't access um, legal information, can't access uh, legal representation. And 
th that I think is, in some ways, I, I would say it's one of the, 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 the biggest problems that our justice system faces. Um, and so we can use um, AI to assist us there. Um, and that's where I think you, you do want to sort of embrace it to, to try to help people. Um, but you've, you've, you've got to factor in that it, it needs to have um, lawyers and people working with it. Um, and so that's where you, you need the, the, the lawyers and the AI have got to sort of go hand in hand. Uh, but it's, it's a cost issue. Um, and I guess the, the, the one other comment to make is when you talk about the, uh, the downsides of AI and the concerns, that I think is also part of what we need to be um, training and communicating to our students. Mm. Uh, because they need to be able to advise um, their clients on those concerns. I mean, and indeed, um, they need to be in a position to, if you like, mount the robo-debt class action. Um, you know, it's all well and good to rely on government to sort of challenge some of these things, uh, but there's, there's nothing like a um, lawsuit being brought by a well-funded class actions firm uh, to focus attention. Um, so I think there's a role for lawyers um, and they, they, they've got to grasp it. So if I can go just to the first part of the question, which is sort of where the law is itself managed through an automated system. And I don't think I'm going to, you know, say that RoboDebt is AI. Um, um, but, you know, is that is the answer then your point, Michael, that, that when, when that happens, it's really for the legal profession to respond through litigation? Um, because the government wasn't involving lawyers at all um, in the RoboDebt. Yeah, I think absolutely. It's, uh, this is where I, uh, I, I guess, um, you, just as lawyers uh, you know, respond to various sort of public interest cases, um, they also need to be uh, responding to the public interest in relation to where technology is going. Mm. Um, and some of that will be pro bono representation. Yes. Um, th there's a whole range of uh, avenues where that can be sort of um, uh, addressed. Mm. Uh, but the, the, the professions, they've got to get on top of this be, because the, the downside is, is the legal profession there for our society? Is, is it fulfilling its mandate? So the sort of point, the education piece, both for students and for, for lawyers on understanding, you know, what these systems are and what their limitations are, um, can actually be useful not only for the use inside a law firm um, or, or, you know, for a lawyer, um, but also potentially to identify possible litigation. Not that I'm suggesting yeah. Alan's is going to become no. a major <laughs> class action plaintiff <laughs> firm, but... <laughs> no, absolutely. Mm. OK. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so question. Do we have a mic? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so a question for me. Um, to me, with I think top tier law firms especially, the moat is sort of the professional insurance as well as the brand, which is like very significant. And I think with businesses that I've run in the past, like we would think about law firms more so as kind of like insurance. It's kind of like we want this done extremely quickly and to a decent quality. Um, to me, it seems like very, very obvious that law firms with AI are going to be able to really just cut down on staff and like just really focus in on those things like brand, we've got this insurance, and then, you know, just drive down costs as a way to become even more competitive. Um, I'd be curious to hear, you know, Allen's, other big law firms, how are you guys thinking about how much leaner could we run these firms and mm. still maintain similar profitability, mm. if not really, more? Yeah. yeah, great, great questions there. Um, speaking quite honestly, we are absolutely looking at this not as a way to reduce headcount or, or um, you know, cut lawyers, but really how can we augment the work we're doing, So, as I touched on earlier, so they can f focus on the higher value aspects of their work. Um, Naturally, that raises a few questions, like one of the things we're grappling with is you don't necessarily want to streamline and automate all of that low-level work because it's critically important for the training of our junior lawyers that they get their hands dirty and, and build up that experience that you get with doing document review and contract review and the like. Um, but, but to your question around um, how we're thinking about it, for us, it's not only about reducing costs for the client, that is a big part of it, because we're thinking about how can we leverage these tools to cut costs and give them better value for money, but also how can we get to the key facts more quickly, as I touched on earlier? How can we give them the responsiveness that they demand in these high pressure situations? So a lot of it is, is about responsiveness, is about cost reduction, is about the quality of 
career experience for our lawyers, to, to be honest. Um, a lot of our lawyers are saying they don't necessarily want to be doing this type of work and that this is a bit of a godsend for them because they're now actually able to spend more of their time building their practice in other areas. So I would say cost reduction is one element, but it's by no means, in fact, I would say it's by no means the driving element. Um, However, we are quite honestly thinking about what does this mean for our business model? And naturally, most law firms will be thinking about that. And there was an article the other day on, you know, could this be the death of the billable hour um, that some of you may have read? Um, and look, I don't think we're quite there yet. It would be my two cents. But, um, you know, it, it will raise questions around how can we make sure we're sharing uh, the value with our clients? Um, how do we price and package our services in a way that makes sense for our clients as well as ourselves? So it will naturally, and frankly, it already has raised questions like that. Um, so that, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, it's by no means a um, solely focused on, on cost reduction. Can I just add a little bit to that? I, I think the, the point of the billable hour and sort of this TNM cost-based pricing model is how the business model of law firms have been. But I think there's many emerging and definitely already in the market business models um, that are more value-based pricing. Yeah. And many other industries use value-based pricing. So that's related in, you know, to fixed fees and, and what does it actually mean for the client who gets the, the service? Because take an example of say, again, the data breach, you have very strict regulatory um, obligations for, for, for turning around an SLA. Otherwise, there's, you know, whatever, millions of dollars in, in fines and, 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 and ramifications, right? That's, that cost doesn't change just because the law firm becomes more efficient, right? Being able to meet that obligation quicker doesn't actually, in, in fact, it enhances the value by being more efficient as the, you know, the, the business environment and the regulatory environment gets more and more complex. Like as I mean, technology is also a culprit of this. As the world, as the business world gets more and more complex, there's just so much more that we need to be able to do. And I think technology plays a really important role in being able to meet those obligations, but also create that space um, for for value price for value based pricing, right? To create you know better margins for law firms, not necessarily to mm. cut down on people and, and efficiency. That's part of it, maybe in some use cases but uh, I'm, I'm bullish on the value-based side yeah. of things. And probably something I'll just add to that to round it off. Um, you know, one of the things we're also thinking about, a lot of our clients' in-house legal functions are under huge cost constraints. Um, you know, they've limited budget for headcount, certainly very little budget for innovation and technology expenditure. So some of the work we're doing actually in it now is how to make them more efficient, you know, creating self-service legal products, obviously with built-in um, sort of legal smarts and logic, but how to enable them to self-generate low-risk legal documents that giving a portal to the business to be able to do that themselves, which routes through to legal or to a law firm only when there are key risks or key red flags identified. So it's, we're extending it not only to our own business operations, but actually the in-house teams of our clients helping their kind of legal optimization processes as well. Um, which, you know, on one hand, you might say, yes, doesn't it do, do yourselves out of a job? Um, but what we're saying, actually, come to a firm like Allen's for the higher value, com complex work, really hear us how you can sort of self-arm to do some of that um, lesser complexity yeah, work. What, what it's worth, I think, it can be incredibly easy for, you know, well-done law firms. Yeah. Well-done yeah. And on that happy note. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, please put your hands together for Evan, um, Michael, and um, sorry, I'm just Lisa. Lisa. <laughs> thank you, Lisa, Thanks. Michael, Evan, um, for this wonderful panel.